January 31st, 1943. The Battle of Stalingrad has been nearing its conclusion, with the Soviets tightening the noose around the surrounded Axis forces in the city. Will the Germans and their auxiliaries surrender, or will they fight to the last? Everything depends on the most wanted man in the city, German Commander Friedrich Paulus. I'm Indy Nidell. This is an extra regular episode for the week of February 5th, 1943. Lots to cover. Okay, January 30th, 1943, and the week begins. Political functionaries of the Nazi party are preparing festivities all over Germany, coordinating rallies and official gatherings. It is the 10th anniversary of Adolf Hitler's ascent to power as chancellor and eventual dictator of the German Reich. From all theaters of the war, commanders of the Wehrmacht send their congratulations to the Führer, as is expected of them. One single telegram, though, reaches Hitler's headquarters from the banks of the River Volga. The swastika flag still flies above Stalingrad. May our fight be an example to the living and coming generations to never surrender, not even in the most hopeless of situations, so that Germany may be victorious. Heil mein Führer. It is signed, Friedrich Paulus. It isn't long until a response is sent. My General Oberst Paulus, to date, the whole German people are deeply moved by its heroes inside this city. Like it has always been in the world's history, your sacrifice as well will not be in vain. In thoughts with you and your soldiers, your Adolf Hitler. The message is received and read aloud deep within the underground cellar rooms of the Univer Mag. The bombed out ruins of the former department store now serve as the last command bunker of the German Sixth Army. Paulus and his staff withdrew their remaining forces into the city once their defensive lines outside of it were broken. Pursued by strong contingents of the 21st, 62nd, and 64th Soviet armies, their city cauldron has been split into two main parts, one located in the south around the city center and one in the north inside the industrial area. There is no longer coordinated defense and no longer centralized leadership. Each cauldron is basically led and defended by its own commanding general. Fighting, however, continues, and Axis soldiers desperately resist the Soviet attacks street by street, house by house. Yet after the loss of the airstrips at Basargino and Pitomnik, The German Sixth Army can no longer really be supplied from the outside, and they are pretty much out of food and ammunition. The few supply bombs that have managed to be parachuted over their positions are nowhere near enough to feed the roughly 100,000 men still trapped in the city. Daily bread rations are down to 75 grams a day. The only thing that still arrives in abundance is awards and promotions. Paulus received the oak leaves to his Knight's Cross on the 15th. Now, on the night of the 30th, he is promoted to Field Marshal by personal order of Adolf Hitler. This, however, is not just a promotion. It is a death sentence. Not since the Napoleonic Wars has a Prusso-German Field Marshal gone into captivity. Paulus knows that Hitler expects him and the Sixth Army to die to the man inside the Kessel of Stalingrad. That evening, German soldiers in the city listen to the speech of Reichsmarschall Hermann Goering. He talks of the Sixth Army's sacrifice, of how they presented a bastion against the Bolshevist threat from the east. Goering calls them heroes who, like the 300 Spartans under King Leonidas, fight for the future of Europe. But while the people over the radio cheer, many of the soldiers in Stalingrad do not. They are expected to die here, to be left behind for a cause many no longer believe in. Some express their outrage and disgust at the lionization of their impending deaths. Most of them, though, are simply preoccupied with their own thoughts, even even awaiting execution, a swift death in the coming hours. Distinguished men remove their badges of rank, their medals and combat awards. Some men fall to panic or to gloomy resignation. Most of the Heavies, the auxiliary Russian, Ukrainian, and Tartar troops, plan to fight as fiercely as they can. Nearly all of them are very much fighting to the last, knowing that Soviet authorities will show them no mercy. You know, a lot of the Axis soldiers have really been kept in the dark about the bleakness of their situation. They have been lied to told that the Fuhrer or Manstein would break them out any day now, or that SS Panzer Corps were gathering at Kalach waiting for the right day to strike. 
a day which never came. To the common soldiers, the loss of the airfields really means that every last chance to get out of Stalingrad has disappeared. So they cling to their last strong points. Many suffer from dysentery, jaundice, and frostbite. Tens of thousands lie inside the cellars and field hospitals throughout the city. Paulus himself is a broken man, neither master of the situation nor really of his own will. He is torn between his loyalty to the German military and the feelings of guilt towards the destruction of his own army, yet he refuses to surrender. Instead, he gives each general and even their divisional and regimental commanders below them the authority to decide the future of their units for themselves. This new order signals the end. At some places, resistance begins to dissolve, as officers lead small groups of men into captivity. In other places, they ready themselves to avoid captivity at all costs. Several commanding generals and higher officers take their own lives or, or get themselves killed in combat intentionally. A few of them assemble small battle groups and try to break through the Soviet lines on their own. It is a last act of desperation, hoping they can then hide in the steppe, the featureless, frozen, barren steppe. Of most of these, nothing is ever heard again. The majority of generals and officers, however, deny Hitler's request for a last glorious stand. They prepare for surrender. Some plan to share the hardships of imprisonment with their men. Others plan to tell future generations of what happened in Stalingrad. As most of you are aware, I research and write all the regular Saturday episodes myself. But these extra ones, I have loads of help from Marcus Linke, who is the best pure military historian I know, but he also has a way with words. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because of his terse Hemingway-like heading to the next section of the research. Get Paulus. Throughout the evening hours of the 30th, Mikhail Shumilov's 64th Army systematically reconquers the city center. Each assault preceded by a bombardment of mortars, rocket launchers, and heavy artillery from beyond the Volga. Then the infantry moves against the German snipers and machine gunners, clearing out cellars with grenades and flamethrowers. Casualties are heavy, but their progress is undeniable, inching their way from the train station towards Red Square. But a sudden panic has gripped Soviet high command. What if Paulus escapes? What, what if there is some hidden plane or, or some last-minute escape plan that they have overlooked and their main prize is preparing a daring flight? Who gets the fun job of explaining that to Joseph Stalin? Most Red Army officers suspect that Paulus is still somewhere inside the Southern Cauldron, but where exactly is anybody's guess? And by now, there is real competition among the troops. Every captured German officer is immediately interrogated about their commander's whereabouts. At this point, even the women who man the Soviet telephone relay stations are making bets on which unit will get to Paulus first. Then the 29th Division finally gets reliable intel from German prisoners close to the Univermag. As a sign of proof for his superiors, a Soviet negotiator brings back a German pistol, a swastika flag, and a name. Paulus. Throughout the night, the fighting continues as the Soviets surround the department store. Soviet artillery pounds the area until the infantry is finally close enough to see the main entrance. It is heavily mined, and each German defender has a submachine gun. Then, in the early morning hours of the 31st, a German general steps out of the entrance, signaling surrender. At 6 a.m., the first Soviet officers begin approaching the Univermag. It is a strange situation, to say the least. The Germans are clearly surrounded and at the mercy of their enemies, yet they refuse to let anyone in that is not of high rank. Only high officers with the authority to negotiate will be allowed. I mean, there is protocol to be upheld, after all. At 7.30, this news reaches Shumilov, who orders a ceasefire between 8 and 10 a.m. Telephones ring hot, trying to get someone of sufficient rank and authorization to the Univermag. At 9 a.m., the chief of staff of the 64th Army, General Ivan Laskin, arrives with translators. Shortly after that, he is joined by Lieutenant Colonel Leonid Vinokur of the Commissariat. As they are led down into the cellar, they are greeted by the remaining staff of the 6th Army, everyone but the field marshal himself. The Soviet officers are taken aback by the stench and the dirt inside the bunker, caused by sweat, excrement, and worse. 
Naturally, their first demand is to see if Paulus is still alive. The field marshal's room is dark, and Paulus himself lies on the bed when Vinocur enters. He describes Paulus as a shell of a man, emaciated and unshaven. His face has nervous tics, and the right eye constantly blinks. Friedrich Paulus remains an enigma to this day. He repeatedly refused to surrender week after week, yet is obviously plagued by his conscience, guilt, and feelings of betrayal. Now he declares himself a private person, no longer in command of the Sixth Army. He will allow himself to be taken captive, but will not surrender, nor can he order others to surrender, even if it would save the lives of his men. The Soviet negotiators do not understand this disciplined apathy, this lack of a clearly defined character, but they do accept it just the same. Paulus and his generals leave the bunker of the Univermag and are led to an open square where a large group of their surviving soldiers is gathering. It is a volatile situation as tired Red Army troops disarm their enemies. The captives are stripped of their valuables, their, their watches, their rings, their mess tins, even their boots. Those who can still walk are to join the columns marching into captivity. Those who cannot are left behind or finished off. Special department groups of the NKVD scour the former German positions, searching for heavies, SS and Gestapo men, panzer troops and field police. Others are mopping up the city in general, looking for German soldiers hiding away inside the ruins. Cries followed by single shots or short bursts of fire echo out throughout the rest of the day. Soviet intelligence officers bring Paulus and his Stalingrad generals from 64th headquarters to Don Front headquarters outside Zavarikino. There they are taken into custody by NKVD agents who begin searching them for any kind of sharp objects. General Schmidt vehemently protests that a German field marshal would not commit suicide with a pair of nail scissors. But the Soviets are taking no chances. Shortly before midnight, Paulus is led into the main interrogation room. Seated there at a long table are Generals Voronov, Telegin, and Rokossovsky. Stenographers are to write down every single word said. As Paulus enters the room, he's photographed by the famous Soviet filmmaker Roman Karman. He and other photographers are there to make sure the world knows of the Soviet Union's greatest victory. Paulus is their grand prize. His captivity effectively ends the fighting in much of the city. The northern cauldron under Karl Strecke still does generally hold out for a couple of days, though. Deep in the factory district, in a maze of trenches, half-buried dugouts, and smashed buildings, the last blood for Stalingrad is shed. No fewer than four Soviet armies throw men and guns against the last Kessel of Stalingrad. Strecker, who has earlier vowed to fight to the last does not want to surrender. Only at a meeting when his own divisional commanders say they will do it themselves does he agree to stop resistance. After 72 days of fighting, the German cauldrons cease to exist. At midday on the 2nd of February, a Luftwaffe reconnaissance aircraft circles high over the city. The pilot relays a short message to Army High Command. No more signs of fighting in Stalingrad. And this time... This time, the Wehrmacht has thrown everything it has, its largest army, the Sixth Army, everything at the enemy, and it has lost. As the Battle of Stalingrad really got going back in September, I had an extra regular episode then. It covered three milestone meetings that happened on one pivotal day. And you can check that out right here. And you can join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com so I can make more extra stuff like this and that on top of the regular work that you see each weekend. It really is your support that finances all of this. So join our forces of history. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time. (laughs) 